When the Facts Change is brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network, in partnership with Kiwi Bank. The bank for Kiwi, looking to get ahead in business and in life. A bank that delivers expertise and banking know-how, smart advice for business owners wanting to invest, grow their business, or diversify. A bank that adapts with technology through the lens of its people and customers. It is a bank with heart that is driven by its purpose. Kiwi, making Kiwi better off. Every morning these days, I get up and check my feeds to see what's happened with the climate. It is absolutely freaking me out, is the, is the way I, best way to put it. I look at these charts because I look at charts for fun, but these are not fun charts. They show that the water temperature in the North Atlantic is at record, record highs. That air temperatures, particularly in Northern Hemisphere during the summer of July, have pushed the world's temperatures to the highest they've ever been uh, for a July. And that when you come down to the southern hemisphere, the ice loss in the Antarctic is not just a little bit above average, it's six times above average. Something has been triggered in the climate and it's now not something that can be put off for very long. In fact, not at all. The rubber has hit the road, and we really, really, really have to be absolutely slamming the brakes on our use of fossil fuels, be it oil, gas, coal. And it's sort of scary that a country like Aotearoa, with enormous amounts of water and dams, at least a couple of years ago, was still importing a million tons of coal from Indonesia to burn in Huntley to keep us warm during the winter. This is frankly not on, and if we're going to get anywhere near our target of not just 100% renewable electricity, but 100% renewable energy, then we have to completely transform how we produce electricity, how we get it around, how we trade it. And one of the ways that's going to happen is solar, because when you look at what's happening in the rest of the world, solar is absolutely exploding. It is not just growing fast from a very small base, it is growing fast from a big base to the point now where China, for example, is adding much, much more solar every year than other types of electricity generation. And China's ability to churn out these panels at incredibly low costs has transformed the economics of solar all around the world. Add in a few subsidies here and there from other governments and much of the extra electricity production that is renewable is going into solar. There is a revolution happening, partly because of the cost of the panels dropping, but also because of the cost of the batteries, the scale of production, the way they're being interchanged with car batteries has come together into a package, which means you can put some solar panels on your roof, you can have a battery on the side of the house or in the basement, and you can start to store electricity in your house. And if you're big enough, you can start to, in effect, share that electricity around the grid and remove some of the problems that people are worried about. If you are shifting millions of cars from petrol and diesel to electricity, the idea they're all going to hook up to the grid all at the same time and melt everything down because your electricity networks aren't strong enough is sort of scary. But... Once you start to have batteries and the ability to share the load and to change the demand profile so that when everyone arrives and plugs in their Tesla or whatever it is to the, to the power point, it doesn't necessarily take the power then. Maybe it waits till two or three in the morning when no one's using the network and it can get electricity cheap. So I'm really curious about how we're doing our solar transformation in New Zealand because it's taken a lot longer than in other places. The government's purity around not subsidising things has meant there aren't many subsidies for solar. And until now, really, there has been not much focus on massive scale solar electricity additions. It is, though, in the last year or so, we're starting to see a lot more solar farms being planned and some of them being built and a lot more solar panels on roofs. Solar Zero is now the biggest installer of these solar panels and batteries into grids and is doing some 
fascinating things, not just with the installation of large numbers of, of uh, solar panel and battery installations in homes, but their business model, which means you don't pay anything up front and you effectively get a locked-in price for uh, the life of the panels and the battery. So you don't have to worry about your price being put up by your electricity company. And you can start to do some clever things with the technology behind the meter to try to not just reduce your power bill, but also to help the rest of the community deal with this challenge and be in a position to be able to hook your Tesla up to the wall and not worry about things <laughs> melting. So this week I speak to the CEO of Solar Zero, Matt Ward, who gives us an insight into how they're growing so fast without subsidies. That's this week on When the Facts Change. Well, kia ora, and welcome to When the Facts Change to Matt Ward, the CEO of Solar Zero. Fantastic to see you, Matt. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. I'm curious about the solar revolution and the idea that we could electrify Aotearoa with solar and deal with some of the issues that solar wind have when intermittency but also try to you know create new ways to generate power apart from our quite centralized system that we have at the moment could you explain for people how solar zero operates from a customer's point of view yeah happy to um a bit of background in terms of uh who we are um solar zero actually was founded in 2008 2009, uh, it was previously called a business called Thermosel, um, which uh, was doing solar hot water systems uh, at the time, predominantly in, in Nelson. Um, and then Andy Booth, our founder, uh, bless his heart, uh, he uh, went from Greenpeace and chasing boats and what have you and settled in, uh, in New Zealand with his lovely wife and raised his family here, decided to uh, democratise access to, to solar. And so started doing uh, solar systems uh, through New Zealand and the, and the Pacific. Um, but very much encountered the problem that uh, solar was expensive. Yeah, back in 2010 to 13, solar was $35,000, $40,000. Uh, and Andy's vision uh, was to make uh, solar accessible for every New Zealander. Uh, so in 2014-15, uh, Andy got together with uh, Sir Stephen Tyndall uh, and developed an energy as a service product or a solar as a service product, uh, essentially uh, for any Kiwi homeowner, uh, they could install solar at their house for free and uh, over 20 years they would uh, reap all the benefits from solar. Um, so that was generation one. Um, then in 2018, as batteries really, really started to emerge, um, the team decided to add the battery into the service, and we partnered with um, with Ecotricity, uh, and now our service is effectively a hundred percent of our customers' needs. It's still uh, zero dollars down. It has the added benefit of guaranteed savings up front, and our typical customer saves around two hundred and fifty dollars up front. Um, and they still get the benefits of that fixed fee for the full 20 years. So I think one way to describe Solar Zero is that it's sort of the intersection between really, really smart technology and, and really, really cool things with uh, with capital to make uh, the energy transition accessible for every Kiwi. Yeah, I'm curious about how the, the economics stack up from a... Um you know, a business point of view, but also from a customer point of view. So if I get this right, I'm a customer, I'm on a, a traditional power deal, I'm paying for some electricity from the uh, gin tailor, and I'm also paying some lines charges uh, to my local lines company. And uh, you're saying to me, we'll install solar panels and a battery and you will pay around $250 a year less than what you would currently pay. And in the years to come, that uh, cost of the electricity, at least, wouldn't go up, even if there's inflation. Yeah. Um, I think that when you look at a customer's bill, 
around about 27% of that is in uh, the distribution side. So obviously, as soon as you move behind the meter, uh, you are avoiding uh, the distribution uh, charges, obviously the variable component thereof. Uh, so that is a large part of the way we're able to achieve savings for customers. That's point one. Um, the second avenue is through Ecotricity, um, we're actually able to completely change the profile of a customer's grid usage. So the grid doesn't actually see our customers at the typical peak times. The only time they see our customers is effectively between 1 and 4 in the morning when we charge our batteries, between 6 and 8 in the morning when people are getting up and making a cup of tea and all that sort of good stuff, um, we discharge the battery. So again, you're not seeing the grid. During the day, solar does its thing and we top up the battery with the excess solar. When you get home, we uh, use the battery. And then for those, I suppose, with have um, households that are you know, gamers or what have you, we, we might have to top up the battery a little bit between 9 and 10 o'clock at night uh, and thereafter. So the one of the reasons we're also able to save our customers money is that we're able to procure that grid electricity at rates that reflect the fact that we are um, creating quite a different energy profile from a typical customer. And when you do that, are you able to export electricity back into the grid? Let's say you have a really sunny day and there's, you've filled up all the batteries and you think, well, wow, let's sell it back to all of those factories that are um, uh, need some power during the middle of the day. It's been a really sunny day. How does that work for you? I think the key thing is that um, there's always been a bit of a, um, a distinction between the import rates and the export rates. So your typical customer will uh, import electricity at, say, 25 cents a kilowatt hour, um, but generally gets somewhere between 8 and 13 cents for export. How does, that, how does that work? It's the same power. Why is there such a gap? It's a good question. <laughs> I'm probably not the right person to ask, if I'm honest. So... So therefore, we actually, uh, the first thing we do with any excess solar is we keep that battery charged so that you can use it at periods of peak pricing. We will only export uh, effectively if the battery is charged and or we think that there's the ability to uh, do some market uh, arbitrage when you see periods of very, very high pricing that we think um, the customer can benefit from. That's obviously... Um, a really, really new thing with the real-time pricing coming in uh, early this year and something that we are um, we're piloting uh, at the moment. But generally, um, I think one of the uh, misnomers around solar is people have always wanted to have massive arrays and it's all been about how much can I export back into the grid, whereas actually the benefit of solar is how much you can self-consume of that solar to offset what you otherwise would have been consuming off the grid. Um, so I think there's a bit of education uh, required. Um, you know, bigger isn't always uh, better in the world of solar. Um, smarter is better in terms of optimizing what's on being generated on your roof and the size of the battery and, and how that all stacks up. So I'm trying to work out why there is this, you know, r very low price for the power that I'm generating into the grid. And whether there's some sort of, you know, um, regulatory intervention, and I understand this is what happens overseas, where the, the gen tailor, the retailer, is forced to pay the same or something quite similar for the electricity they're buying back than the electricity they're selling the customer. It's interesting. You've seen in other markets, for example, Australia, one of the ways that they drove the uptake of solar in Australia, and um, I know you like stats, so I'll give you one, but around 30 odd percent of households in Australia have solar on their rooftop. We're about two and a half, three percent. So we've got a long way to go to catch up. Um, and a lot of that was driven by quite high uh, feed in tariffs uh, for customers. Uh, so they were uh, exporting back into the grid at yeah, 25, 30 cents a kilowatt hour. So in Australia, the ethos was bigger is definitely better. Unfortunately, what's happened in Australia is that those subsidies um, have been uh, unwound. Uh, and now you have customers in South Australia and other parts like that that are exporting back into wholesale markets where the prices 
zero, negative at some times, two, three, four, five cents kilowatt hour, which has materially changed the economics of solar. And that is why every solar installation we do comes with a battery, because um, that's uh, ultimately where we see we create that value. How much of a factor then is the falling cost of the batteries in making this possible? One way to think about the, the battery is that about 25 to 30% of the value of a battery is deployed in what we call time shifting uh, the demand or that demand flexibility. So that's moving energy from peak periods to uh, off peak periods. The other 75% is actually how you deploy that battery as part of a virtual power plant to provide services back into the grid. And that's what we at Sol Zero are all about. So last year, we went live in the uh, sur and fur markets, or the reserves markets. Um, and we were the first people that we know about globally to use uh, distributed residential batteries to do that. So could you explain how that um, works in a network sense? You have enough customers with enough batteries that, in effect, they are, in a virtual sense, storing up a lot of power in lots of different places, and then you're able to shift it around virtually and then maybe export it to other customers. Is that right? Yeah, so we have around 72 uh, megawatt hours of battery storage at the moment across our 11,000 customers. So that's about the size of a a smallish grid scale battery. A typical grid scale battery might be about a, a 100 megawatt hours or something in that order. Um, so what we're effectively doing in that instance is being uh, asked to be on standby. So we're just like other generating assets that are on call and if needed will get, will get called. Uh, what we're able to do is through our technology, we have a, um, a computer called the ICOM and we can sense changes in frequency and when we sense a change in frequency, and it goes, I think, below 49.2 hertz, our systems then uh, start discharging uh, to address that change in frequency. And so that's how we participate in this markets. One way to think about it is we're a little bit like the diesel generator you used to keep in the garage, except for that we're clean and green. Um, so we're there, we're on standby. Um, and that's, that's how we actually make the Sol Zero service economic to our residential customers because effectively we're using 75% of the value of the battery to perform those services, to help Transpower, help the lines companies and the customers getting the benefit of that. Um, because to be honest, if you, if you weren't able to do that stuff right now, you wouldn't buy uh, a battery purely to time shift in a residential setting. Uh, unless you had, um, you know, big emotional drivers around security, stability, and what have you. But if you're purely doing the economics of it, um, unless you can do what we do, um, you would just be a solar-only uh, uh, in installation. And that's the beauty of the solar zero model, as we like to think of it as a, a bi-directional model. On one side, we're looking after our customers and we're providing them clean, green energy, saving them money and what have you. Uh, and the way we do that is that we're also deploying that fleet of batteries or the virtual power plant, as we call it, to support Transpower and the like. A recent example of this is actually we were working with um, Areake, who are absolutely fantastic to work with, uh, and the guys at Transpower and the EA. And we developed a, a winter peaking product. Um, effectively, uh, we're using the dispatchal notified load uh, framework that was introduced back in May, April, whenever it was, for the real-time pricing. And again, we we're able to receive a low residual uh, notice from Transpower, and that tells us to get all the batteries ready, and then those batteries are configured to discharge when the real-time price hits $3,000 a megawatt hour. Um, so what's beautiful is actually we're able to respond in milliseconds whereas traditional gas peaker plants might be 15 minutes uh, and uh, Huntley and what have you might be uh, a couple of hours or, uh, or what have you. So really this technology now is demonstrating its uh, wider application and um, we're very, very thankful to Ariake uh, for, for them coming on board with that pilot 
Um, we had our first uh, test last week where we had a CAN notice um, and the systems were all ready to go and it's just so we have, part of me is wishing for a really, really cold day so we can show everyone what we do and the other part of me doesn't want that to happen for obvious reasons. So looking at it from a distance, the, in a way, the, the sun that shines in the uh, summer, assuming it does shine in the summer in New Zealand, um, goes into a battery and over, the, over time gets stored up and in, in a virtual sense moved around. And then when we have a cold snap, uh, it gets uh, used up uh, to help uh, when there's a real load on the system. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I will say one thing, actually. I think you um, you remind me so much of um, some of my friends, and like, they're saying, "Oh, it never it's never sunny in New Zealand." We actually have more sun in New Zealand in daylight hours than places like Barcelona and France and and what have you. So, I know that we don't have as much uh, sunshine or daylight hours as Australia and California, where people traditionally uh, associate solar. But those European markets where solar is going off. Uh, particularly in uh, Western Europe, uh, our uh, sunshine hours are ahead of that. Um, so we need to dispel that myth. New Zealand is a really, really good place for solar resource. Um, and uh, and solar, um, yeah, it's made for New Zealand. So that's, that's the question then. With just 2.5% of our production in solar, I look around the world and every day or two I see some extraordinary charts exponential growth in solar output from the likes of China and, as you say, um, in Europe. And globally, the price of these solar panels keeps getting cheaper. The price of the batteries and the availability of the batteries keeps getting cheaper. But I don't sense that sort of exponential growth in New Zealand. What is stopping us? I think there's a couple of things to note. So last year, there was a 70% increase uh, in the capacity um, to t 640 megawatts, um, and that 95% of that comes out of out of China. Um, in terms of uh, generation, uh, there was yet yeah, 270 terawatt hours, which blows my mind. I actually can't visualise what that even looks like, um, and that increased to uh, 1,300 terawatt hours. So that was a 26% increase in solar generation capability globally. I think that's what you're referring to. But you probably don't realise that in New Zealand we had a 25% increase over that same time. So we grew to 255 megawatts. So I think actually we are growing at the same rate as the rest of the world, uh, particularly because of what we're doing in a residential setting. Um, the size of our virtual power plant is larger on a per capita basis than virtually anywhere in the world including California, Australia, and what have you. So um, in a residential sense, uh, I'd like to think you know, New Zealand's really, really um, starting to pull its socks up. Uh, and we are starting to see that exponential growth. And what we're hearing from our customers is um, there's two or three key motivations for that. One of them is the cost of living. I mean, power prices are seemingly going up 5 to 8% per annum. And then, of course, if you overlay that with the 70% reduction in solar and 85% reduction in batteries, then those economics are improving all the time. Uh, and the level of savings we can offer customers is literally improving on a, on a six-monthly basis. And the other key thing that we're hearing from our customers, particularly post-Cyclone Gabriel, is that energy security is becoming more and more important to them as well. And so during Cyclone Gabriel, we had 3,000 customers, so basically about a third of our customer base, they lost power at the grid. However, uh, and the average length of time was about 25 hours actually. However, for 97.5% of the time, our customers were able to power on through, some for right up to five or six days. So we had these great stories. Um, my, my favourite is Erin and, and Huntley. She's ex Christchurch. She, she actually looks out over the Huntley power station. She had no idea she'd even had a power cut. 
and had the neighbours over to come and uh, heat up um, the milk for their kid and what have you. And we had similar amazing stories out of Hawke's Bay. And I think as New Zealanders, we've taken energy uh, for granted. We always have just thought, if I flip the switch, it will come on. Um, but our highest um, demand days ever have all been recorded this winter. Obviously, it's, there's no secret around the uptake of EVs, um, climate-related and weather events becoming more and more uh, prolific. So I think we're entering a, uh, an interesting period where to get to 100% renewable by 2030, we've really got to figure out how we solve what we call the, the energy trilemma. Uh, and that is making energy secure. So that's where um, da um, batteries and storage and what have you become super important. Um, making it affordable um, because we can't just build things at any cost and pass that on to the customer. And obviously the third limb is obviously the re renewable limb uh, as well. I'm curious about um, how uh, this can be done much faster though and whether the government, as they have in other countries, need to get in and provide a subsidy to essentially put the chicken before the egg and to really turbocharge it. Um, do you think we can get to 100% renewable by 2030, it's not that far away now, uh, without a government subsidy of some sort? Um, I think just to provide a bit of context, I mean, at Solar Zero this month, uh, in August, we will do 400 installations from the top of the North Island to the bottom of the South Island. Uh, in August last year, we were doing 300. And then the year before that, we were doing 200. So we've doubled what we've, we're doing in the space of a couple of years. And we've done that without any subsidies whatsoever. So we've grown a res what we think is a resilient business model that's not predicated on the whims of what's happening uh, in, in Wellington. Unlike other markets in Australia, for instance, where they had subsidies um, and that grew massive uptake of solar, but also issues around quality. You had a lot of people coming in and installing solar, banking the subsidy, and you'd never hear from them again. One of the beauties about our model is that we have that 20-year commitment to our customers um, so they know if anything ever goes wrong, we're there for them. And also, um, we upgrade the technology along the way. So our first generation of customers, their, their first computers, we're actually out there now replacing them now. We pay for all that. And that's just so that they can start adding in uh, EV smart charging, uh, sol uh, hot water heat pumps, all that sort of good stuff. Um, so I think we've, we've grown really, really quickly. Um, I'd say the key impediments to our growth uh, is definitely that trained workforce. Um, we've opened a national training center uh, and we're working with existing uh, electrical contractors and what have you to bring them into um, the solar space because um, a lot of them are really interested in it, actually. I think there's a lot of people quite passionate and also intrigued about the, the technology that sits behind it. So the solar geeks or the battery geeks um, are keen to get involved. Just finally, uh, another part of the equation to get to 100% um, renewable and, and not just for 100% renewable electricity, but to really get to 100% renewable everything, so converting the diesel and petrol cars to electric, uh, there's this idea that our network can't handle it. If everyone rocks up in their Tesla at 6 o'clock at night and plugs it in, the, the grid goes down. Uh, do you see um, the batteries in electric vehicles becoming part of the solution because in some other countries they've required the cars to be two-way cars i.e they essentially become a bit like a wall battery but with four wheels yeah i mean there's a couple of good points around that i think um obviously about 80 percent of our electricity right now uh is renewable so you'd think actually getting to 100 percent renewable by 2030 uh, if the demand side stayed flat would be solved with uh, um the six uh, gigawatts of um, of solar renewable and other wind that's in the in the pipeline, but as you say, the demand equation is changing a lot. So only thirty percent of our total energy is actually renewable, and that's because of what you're seeing in, in transport and the like. 
Um, so we do actually have a big part to play, as you say, as New Zealand adds a million EVs uh, over the over the coming decade. And you're right, you can't come home at six o'clock and plug in uh, a million EVs because the load on an EV is actually about three times the load of the rest of the house. So if we think we've got constraints now, um, try multiplying that by two or three times when we all come home. So that's why um, businesses like ourselves and there are others are developing these smart EV chargers um, to, to make sure that um, in our case, we're able to identify the sole resource for that day using weather data and other things. Um, our AI is able to uh, get an idea of the typical household load so that we can then develop an eco mode and the customer can sleep when they next need the car so that we're charging the car at the most appropriate time. Um, I think um, there's a lot of commentators, uh, their biggest concern around EVs is what it does to distribution. I think there are markets like Christchurch with their existing electricity infrastructure that can absorb uh, a couple of hundred thousand EVs if they're charged at the appropriate time and they're not just charged at seven in the morning and six at night. So that's where the smarts that we're developing um, with our VPP uh, and our battery technology really comes to the fore. Um, BCG put out a uh, a really, really good document last year, which identified that New Zealand had spent $42 billion uh, to get us to 100% renewable electricity by 2030. And half of that was to upgrade uh, distribution. Um, now, I haven't pulled over every single page of, of that report, but it would be interesting to know uh, how much of that uh, relies on um, changes in demand flexibility and the real impact that we can make by smart charging of EVs. Um, to the second part of your question around using uh, the EVs as batteries themselves, absolutely, that, that has a role to play in future. The only thing I would say though is, um, if you have a car and you have solar on your roof and you're heading out for the day, then that car will not be able to store your excess solar. Um, so that's where there's definitely a role for stationary batteries uh, as well and into the foreseeable future. Matt Ward from Solar Zero, thank you very much for being on When the Facts Change. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. When the Facts Change was brought to you by the Spin Off Podcast Network, together with KiwiBank. Visit kiwibank.co.nz to find out how KiwiBank are making Kiwi better off.